Thanks for coming out. Um, I, uh, before I dig into this whole presentation, there's a couple things I want to mention. One, I do not do this by myself. I have a team um, right now. Uh, Alec, Courtney, Dustin, Dave, Matt, Catherine, these people make this happen. And, you know, I sort of direct things and um, try to run the show, but, but they're doing a lot of work on it, so it's not just me. Um, and most of them are not here today because they hear me lecture them all the time, and they don't, <laughs> they'd rather work and get things done. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is there's a couple clips in the presentation that come from a film of this book uh, by Andrew Zuckerman. It's a series of interviews with 60 uh, world leaders, politicians, artists, um, he made a film. There's also a, a book called Music, which is similarly um, fashioned. When these videos pop up, that's where they're coming from. Uh, and not everybody's named, but if you want to afterwards, you can check the books out. Um, I also brought a copy of another book I mentioned, Invisible uh, New York. So um, when I was called about this and I started thinking about making, I started thinking about the community and the people that we have here. Um, I make things. But a lot of the conversations that I have with a lot of these people and a lot of people in the room that I know have to do with how similar all of our worlds are. We make things, but we have different media, food, fashion, music, art, performance, design, photography, more architecture, graphic design. We all sort of have an energy about the way that we want to do things, but we choose a different path and a way to do it. And I started thinking, how, how did I get there? And I started breaking it down and thinking the sources or you know, the components of, of creation being vision, resources, and passion. I'm gonna frame this in my history. So I'm digging back to like 10 years old. Um, this applies to a lot of the, everybody here. Whenever you decide to do something, you're impacted by these things. But I'm gonna frame it in my own experience just to try to tell the story and relate it. Um, with vision, I'm gonna start out with uh, picking on dad. Uh, my dad was a dork when I was 10, and he's still a dork. Uh, he just dorks out about different things now. And at the time, he had this idea that computers were going to be the wave of the future, and that you know, communication was going to happen through the telephone lines, and you could find information. Lo and behold, wow, you know, that happened. Uh, in the middle is a, pro a product he brought home, the Capro 2, the, the, the coolest laptop on the planet in 1982. Um, <laughs> At school, we had the Apple II, and the Apple II computer used a programming language called Logo. Logo has this little character called a turtle that has a pin tied to its butt, and you can tell it to walk 10 paces and, um, you know, take a left. And so I was at school, and this was the kind of stuff that I dug into when I was 10. Needless to say, the last one was not me at 10 years old, but it gives you the idea of where some of this came from. And this is, you know, 1982 computer. So, skip forward five years, high school. I still haven't got it in, out of my head yet. I'm drawing little triangles and patterns and, you know, connecting lines and figuring out that if you draw a bunch of straight lines in a system, they look like curves. And so I'm kind of stuck on that. Skip forward five, six years. I'm in college at NC State. I'm studying architecture, industrial design, trying to figure out what I want to do. And I start using language, balance, gravity, motion, you know, geometric, organic. And I'm sketching, trying to figure out how to make things move and activities. And this is when the Ouroboros sort of pops up. Um, and that allowed me a little bit of room to actually build some stuff. And I had a shop that I could use. And, uh, a little bit of leeway in my program to make stuff and so I'm working with wood, steel, fiberglass, rope, um, cardboard. My professors are sort of pushing and let me do things, even using the hyperboloid in that chair, which is still sitting outside my office. 
uh, today. Um, move into pro-life, start working in architecture and seeing all this huge stuff on steel and concrete and working at Clearscapes and, and I go to New York to visit my girlfriend at the time and she brings me into this show of a, of a book uh, by Stanley Greenberg that's about infrastructure. And I just get sort of captivated because all these pictures in my head are connected to you know, bound cables and suspension bridges and things like that. And so I start tinkering with structure systems, trusses, can you balance you know, a thousand pounds with a slate and a concrete on top of little thin lines and, and bundled rods and that kind of stuff. And I'm still tinkering trying to you know, develop the idea. Now, in the years since that all happened, I look at you know, swirling leaves in the wind and uh, the geometric pattern of, of plants, DNA strands, uh, signal waves, sound waves, and these things have found their way into a variety of projects that we've built over the years. These are all probably within the last five or so, but it's, you know, you see something, you kind of absorb it and want to figure out a way to make it show up in things. Part of it for me is just exploration. Um, going to New York, uh, San Francisco, going to gallery shows. I spent uh, three hours in the MoMA, in MoMA the last weekend of Richard Serra's show with Massive Attack and headphones wandering around through walls of steel. And you just sort of get into looking at things. Calatrava, who I just fell in love with when I found out who he was. Um, the internet matters to me. I sit down in the morning with a flipboard and scan and look at stuff. And years ago, Joey Roth designed this little teapot. And I was so enamored by it that I had to get one. It's a limited edition cast piece. He was an industrial design student who'd been launched and started his own line. And now he's making ceramic speakers. And this kind of stuff is just really incredible to me. I mean, it's thoughtful and well designed. And then following through on the process was pretty incredible. So the internet has made a difference. Um, now, the turtle has become a rhinoceros and grasshopper. This is uh, a new thing for me, parametric design. I got asked, I got poked by a friend at Clark Nexon and one at Gensler about the L idea. And then David Hill asked me to, to, to sit in on a lecture or a, a review at NC State. And so I sort of dug in and started playing with it. And it's sort of the new version of the, you know, walk ahead and turn left. Uh, a lot more complicated, and I still haven't figured it out. But it's a pretty amazing advance. So the idea of vision is, I have a friend who's a musician, and he asked me to sit down, and he interviewed me about art, because he wanted to plug it into some of his music. And after an hour's worth of conversation, he boiled it all down to this one phrase, which was, it, it's what moves you. And he pulled it and put it in a techno song, which was pretty cool. But I think the idea of vision is what, what generates energy? What makes you feel? And then how can you take that and sort of use it to create? So, you know, to so sort of launch into some wisdom, uh, what do you do with it? I'm going to let Billy Connolly talk about this. I think Buddhism that says, find what you should be doing and do it. And I think it baffles a lot of people except people who actually did it, who actually were lucky enough to find what they should be doing. And I tried to tell my children, I said, I said, just try and see what you're drawn to when you do something that you you feel vocationally drawn to. It's not like a job. It's like what you should be doing. It's your raison d'etre. It's the reason to wake And you wake up feeling good in the morning. Work imposes itself on you as part of its power. You respect it, or you fight with it all your life. If you are grabbed by art, um, I think you should do whatever comes best to you, um, whether it's a novel, or a play, or a song, it doesn't matter that much as the fact that you are doing something about the situation. So, in order to do something, you have to have resources. And I've sort of broken this down into sections. Um, and talent, education, opportunity. Um, this is sort of the fuel for the fire if you have, you know, oxygen, fuel, and an igniter. Uh, the idea of natural talent is sort of debatable. I think uh, I've had a lot of conversations with people that say, well, you've got to have something if you want to build on it, and, and you can build on that. I'm not necessarily a true believer that it's necessary to create or make things, but um, I'm going to let uh, 
Bill talk about it. There has to be a certain gift in place, and there has to be a certain intellect in place. You can't get to wonderful without passing through all right. You can't <laughs> 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 uh, run in the whole show. And if you happen to have talent, then you take that uh, technique somewhere with your talent, and you create new thing. Often you reject all of the technique, like in panning, you know, you pan and you reject everything. But I mean, the fact of rejecting, uh, you know, in, imply that you have acquired it, otherwise there is nothing to reject. There is no way that uh, uh, we can escape ourselves. But if I give you a recipe and I give five people the same recipe, I will have five different dishes on the table. I mean, there is no way to escape it. Um. So I sort of leave it up to you guys to decide how important that is. Um, it's, it, it's important to think about, um, but I try not to determine it and I have fun talking with people about it. As far as education goes, you know, I'm going to dip back into old school. Um, you know, I was the kid who took apart everything that was given to him. Um, and when I was like seven, they gave me a racetrack and within the day it was in parts. Um, and my mother reminded me the other day that when I went to visit my, my grandfather in Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, he would find things around the house that had been taken apart and he described them as being Matthewed. Um, <laughs> and so I was always in trouble for that. And I think my parents sort of figured out that th they needed to direct me into something and so they, you know, find something that I thought they, they thought I'd like and direct it. Dad's tool guy, you know, started out with the hand tools and then ended up with the dangerous stuff, radial arm saw, ooh. Wow. Um, and, you know, mom with the sewing machine and cross stitch, which drove my sister crazy because I was always, like, taking her projects and finishing them. Um, <laughs> and she still complains about that now. Um, moving to college, you've got professors, Wayne Taylor, Vince Foote, Brian Lafitte, Susan Cannon, these people who sort of directed and allowed me to just sort of build stuff. And uh, I, I have a good friend. Uh, I had one professor who didn't really like me, th threatened to fail me three times, and uh, I had another friend in that class, and he said, if you spent half the time that you spent in the, um, in the shop making things up here drawing, then you might pass. And uh, he, he got threatened to fail, too. Vinnie Petraka, his tonic design, um, good buddy, sort of saw it headed way ahead. So I leave school, and I end up working with Thomas, and I'll tell you, you, you got time to get things done and then you end up in the real world and, and, and it just forces itself on you. And one of the things that he said to me that I always remember and say over and over again is the difference between craftsmanship and obsession is time. You have to get it done. And this stuff is more complicated and large scale than anything I've ever seen in my life and it was amazing. Um, during the genesis of the whole earth casting series there were so many things that, that, that he was pushing on that, that we were working on that nobody had ever seen before. You know, you can't help but just be immersed in, in education. And to me, that's what it was. It was force you to realize what the real world holds and what you have to do in order to get things done. Five years worth, and I learned more than I'd ever seen in my life, and it was an amazing experience. Um, so moving on from there, the education now is the problems. How do you change the light bulbs? How do you get a 30-foot tall thing in a 6-foot-8 door? How do you snake a 9-foot wide spiral 40 feet long through a space 10 feet wide. Um, you know, how do you get a 16 foot long glass lacquered automotive finished room into the fourth floor of a building? Well, you have to crane it through the window. And, you know, structural integrity, the marquee in the town of Cary, the wind blows through there. Engineers, designers, all these people sort of influence the decisions and the artwork and the vision is part of it, but the problem solving is really the education and it happens every day. And I've learned something yesterday, uh, and it will be tomorrow, every day. Um, so with the idea of problem solving comes problem creation. I'm going to let Chuck Close talk about this one. Far more interesting than problem solving is problem creation. How do you back yourself into a corner where nobody else's answers are applicable, where nothing else fits? And if you ask yourself an interesting enough question, your uh, solution will, by nature, be personal. Your best work is your expressing yourself. Now, you may not be the greatest at it, but when you do it, you're the only expert in it. When I teach students in architecture, I try to get them to understand that they have a signature. Their body, their hand-eye coordination, their biological 
or their makeup does make them write their name differently than I write my name. That was Frank Gehry, by the way. I don't think there was a label on there. So how do you get to solve the problems? Uh, it's, you know, with the kind of work that I do, it can be internal. I can't generate all this stuff. So you need an opportunity. And in the beginning, you know, the opportunity comes from school. And I had an opportunity. Thomas gave me the opportunity to work hard and learn a lot with him. And then I moved on. And I had a community of people who sort of helped provide opportunities for me and lead the way. Corky Devlin, Steve Goldsmith, Gab and Eric at Museum of Art, Jim Thompson, Darren Lathan at Little, or at uh, Due to Pain, Dennis Quaintance who owns restaurant Lucky 32. Um, these folks sort of gave me a chance and they presented the problems and let me try to figure out a way to solve them. And in the years since, we've had hundreds of relationships. The, the business has produced well over 500 projects in the last 13 years. And without the people that I mentioned, none of that would get done. We've had some really interesting things happen lately. And if you follow Facebook, then you've probably seen all this stuff I'm going to talk about. If you don't, then it'll be news to you. But the interesting thing is that some people hate Facebook. They have no interest in interacting with it. And to me, it introduced me to this guy that made something possible that wouldn't have been otherwise. And I sent a friend request to this guy I thought was a realtor that was a friend of mine. And it turns out that he wasn't a realtor. He was a BAFTA award-winning composer instead. <laughs> and, um, and he accepted because I had a picture of a piece of art. And he was like, well, that's cool. Um, I don't know this guy, but hey. And about a year later, he sent me a message. And he said, I've got this project that I'm working on. And I want to talk to you about metal. And so he came over to the studio. I discovered he lives a block from my shop. And he came over to the studio, and we started talking. And he just took a bunch of metal parts to his studio and started banging on them. And what he revealed to me was that the, the video game Tomb Raider was being rebooted. They'd been working on this for years, and he'd been selected as the composer. And what he wanted to do was make some aggressive sounds. And after our conversations and the energy between the two of us, and now we're sort of like brothers, he, he said, maybe I can get them to like, do something with this. We could create a piece of art that they could own. And so I'm going to let him talk about that. For music, the game for Chains on a metal board, or like you're banging a metal fence. Two weeks later, Jason called me up and he's like, So, this guy who's like the sculptor who lives right around the corner from me, I was talking to him about the idea of creating an instrument. And I'm like, That sounds completely insane. We have to do that. Attack from the Sport, one of the most iconic franchises in the world, brought a unique challenge. How best to capture the emotional timbre? Characters and islands in music. People, I give you the instrument. <laughs> Creating an instrument gave it this unique identity and a voice. Yeah. yeah. The very beginning of the game is, is nothing but the instrument. So this was a lot of fun. And we spent a year tinkering with the parts and trying to figure everything out. And uh, in the end, you know, everything kind of came together last minute. The film crew came in and it all sort of emerged. After the game came out, we decided that we were going to give a little, little gift. Um, I call it a piece of the island to the, the, the developers of the game. And there's one of them here. You can see them up there. And every little piece of this, this gift is connected to something in the game. And if you play the game and you walk near a tomb, that's the sound you hear. So it's built, the instrument is built into the, to the game in all kinds of ways that I never imagined that it would be. And it was a really amazing experience. So, uh, about three, four months later, I get this phone call from the assistant to Dr. Vaughn, who is an orthopedic surgeon. And Dr. Vaughn has all these, this collection of stuff. 
and it's all you know hip and knee joints and and he said I want a table for my office that goes with this chair that I've got and I said absolutely this sounds awesome and you know and then I get all this stuff and I'm like Ugh. and so there's this there's this there's this wave of really cool and oh my god um, and uh, uh, I had a there, there were moments in this that were really kind of fun. So then we go to the computer, Rhino, you know, drop the parts and start thinking. And here's the thing, uh, cobalt, chromium, alloy, and titanium are pretty hard materials and we don't have the equipment to deal with it. And so I had to think of a way to put this thing together that would work. And then I had to think, think well, you know, what, what's it gonna look like? And I started thinking about external fixation. Now, um, I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's sort of like when they're gonna work on you and you're messed up, they put metal frames around the outside of your bones. Um, don't ever Google external fixation. <laughs> you, won't, you won't sleep for a day. Um, but, so I dug in and started working and there was all these different designs we went through. It took months to figure it all out. And where we landed, um, 148 femoral heads. Uh, that tray weighs 50 pounds on its own. This thing almost broke my back to work on. And um, 10 hip joints and five knee joints and uh, some fun with photography in the end, but he was really happy with it, and it was a really amazing adventure. So opportunity-wise, top-notch fun. Um, next, I got a call from a friend in Atlanta who I'd been trying to work with for a little while about the Omni Hotel, and they wanted something musical, and so we started tinkering with ideas, and a lot of it was sort of looking like lines, and they kept going back to bronze, and, and through our conversations, we sort of, the question got asked, well, what about symbols? Would that work? And so I drew up a, you know, half a dozen designs, and we start working on the idea. The caveat being, I had like a month left when they finally cut the, the, the line on this, and I was calling companies trying to get sponsorship and figure out how to get this thing to happen. We, out of sort of blind luck, got connected with Andy Zildjian, who is the president of Sabian. And he green-lighted it, and not only that, but from the first contact to when the 166 of their top line, AAX, printed for the project arrived was five business days. Wow. It was like, boom. And I was scared because I had three weeks. And we got the whole thing done from first conversation with Andy to finished in, in less than a month and delivered to, the Nash and to Nashville. The location is pretty cool because it's at the entrance of the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum upstairs. So uh, across from the Music City Center, which is this crazy $580 million building, 10 stories tall. And um, it was just an amazing adventure. And it all happened right away. And without Sabian's help, we wouldn't have been able to do it. I, I actually called them about some extras. And if you guys play this, it'll I like the hot hat. Um, uh, I got them to send me a little set, which they helped me out with that too, um, so that we could have a sort of a token and memory of the whole process. So these are, um, these are opportunities. And as far as resources go, that's how I, I, I break it down. The fuel for the fire, what you have to have to, to work. So you have an idea, you have pictures in your head, and then you have this ability, these resources. W do you do it? Wisdom is about experience. Your experiences in your life, uh, which hopefully would include risk taking and being somewhat adventurous. I suppose importantly, risk it. Go for it. In your life, things give you another chance, another go at it. It's very important to, to take enormous risks and do them as daring. You don't stop doing things because you get old. You get that because you stop doing <laughs> So you got to keep moving. And I'm going to not focus on like the, the cool stuff. Um, I mean, there's a little history here. But part of the idea of passion and the drive that's required to work is that you're going to run into problems. You're going to hit times when you don't want to do anything. Um, Dad said to me once years ago, uh, being professional means waking up knowing that you don't want to do what you got to do and going and doing it anyway. And if you have to be a professional in this world, then there's just times when you're not going to like it. Now, what carries me through is sort of the passion and, and in, in a way, distraction. I'm crazy ADD about stuff, and so I'm always looking for something to keep me moving. 
when I was a kid, I was passionate about all kinds of things. You know, I had hobbies out the wazoo. Every year I picked something different. Bracelets, which I actually made those. Archery, juggling, photography, tie-dyes, guitar, like all this stuff. And, you know, I was busted in class time, tie-dyes under the table, and I was always busy making stuff. Um, to mention that family is connected to all of this is really important because my whole family is like this. We all sort of just do stuff. And my, my brother's a photographer, you know, dad made jewelry and makes bowls and awesome stuff. My sister's a performance artist, dancer, uh, fire performer, and she does visual arts. My mom is making stained glass. She's had a bunch of hobbies over the years. We're all sort of crazy that way. We do stuff. And it's really nice to have that kind of support. Um, and, and if you ever, you know, get into a crazy situation, they're going to understand why. So we all sort of get along that way. As far as exploration, this, the things that I'm going to mention here have to do with, with how I keep going when what I want to do isn't working. And about nine years ago, I started tinkering with this idea because I was frustrated with management. I was just getting into business and I was starting to see my, my, my role in the making part of it you know, fade and I was managing projects and doing all of this and I thought, I don't like this, you know, I don't want to have to deal with this. So I'm going to make it go away, making all this permanent stuff, what should I make that doesn't last? Okay, well, ice, you know, it's going to melt. And so I picked the idea of the executive toy um, and I started trying to sink 120 volt electrical fixtures into water, which is just, you know, a great idea. Um, <laughs> And we busted molds and for like five months I tinkered with this thing at small scale and then we started growing and I figured it out and, and, and about a year later I had a show at Design Box, the first show of these and, and ever since it's been sort of years, um, uh, although it seems that my technology is sort of failing me and blinking over there, the, the LED lighting has helped recently with the, the failure of these but they're always different. Everyone that comes out of the freezer, I learned something new. It's been years. I've made 60 of these things, and they're all weird. But the reason I did it was I needed something else. I needed a way to keep going and feel excited about something. But whatever it was that I, was, I had going on was harder. Another way I did that was, you know, years after this, I had a flash presentation. I had some music. I was a little worried that maybe it would be bad to use other people's music. And so I pulled the guitar back out, and I bought a couple microphones, and I went in the spray booth. And every morning I'd sit and just play this song over and over and over and over again. And uh, like 50 takes later, I finally had enough pieces that I could put it all together. And so I produced the track and I put it on the CD and I went through all this work. And I, bless music producers, I can't do this. I, I, I had a lot of fun with it. And I learned a lot. But it was a way for me to sort of get the energy going. Um, the last example that I'll, I'll sort of cite is photography is sort of dork out for me. Like I've been learning, especially in the last couple of years, I tried to take a picture of one of my pieces and I found out my iPhone did a better job than the camera. And I thought, I need a new camera and I need to learn. And Brian Reagan sort of gave me a little bit of tips and pointers, shooting raw, Lightroom, all that kind of stuff. And so now whenever we do something, I go to crazy lengths to make sure that I can get good pictures. And a lot of the little things that I do that aren't, don't have anything to do with work that are sort of a, a, a quick project, fundraisers, awards, you know, even the, um, the Pinewood Derby car, which it, it, won a, it won a best in show award, but it was the slowest car on the track. <laughs> <laughs> it looked really pretty, but it just didn't do anything. Um, and then the piece that's here, Coriolis, this is actually a, a gift of a friend. Um, uh, 20 years I've known this woman and she was like, 10 years ago she said, I want to get married just so you'll make me something for my wedding. <laughs> and, um, and there it is. She actually let me, let me use it for today. But photography helps. And I'm trying to learn flash photography and all this kind of stuff. And so it's a way to, it's not work, but it helps work. But it's sort of, you know, it, it makes a difference. So. You have all these components. The reason for the passion part of it is to keep moving. And this is, uh, I think it's our last clip. I'm going to, I think Chuck Close has something to say about this. I always thought that inspiration is for amateurs. Uh, the rest of us just show up and get to work. If you wait around for the clouds to part and a bolt of lightning to strike you in the brain, you're not going to make an awful lot of work. But if you just get to work, Something will occur to you, and something else will occur to you, and something else that you reject will push you in another direction. I work every day 
I work essentially, now that my children are growing up in the house, I work essentially 30 to 65 days of the year. I work Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, it doesn't make any difference. And, um, you know, the pleasure I get and the momentum that comes from just keeping and working. Any day that you don't do any painting is a totally lost day. Any day that you just do a little something, all those little pieces of something add up. I think the happiest way of life is to be developing or making, making things. Because if you don't do anything, Most of us give up too early. Failure is an absolute essential in life. If we never failed, how could we possibly succeed? Because we could only extend ourselves to the limit of what we know. Failure teaches us what we don't know. Of course you're going to fall down. Of course you're going to. But it's your way. When you get to the end, you'll know something. Persistence. So my thought is, if you have these things, then you can pretty much do whatever it is that you want to do. I mean, if you set your mind on something and you can find a way to learn about it, have an opportunity, take one, say yes. Uh, I always say that uh, Christopher Walken says yes just about everything. And uh, <laughs> it shows, uh, but, <laughs> but he's done a lot. And he's a pretty amazing guy in that regard. Um, uh, my, my last thought on this has to do with the mugs. Um, for those of you that got them, you get to take them home. Uh, Judd Patterson, who's here, uh, etched all these. Uh, and it's pretty cool. They're sandblasted. They're, they're pretty nice. Um, this symbol is something I, I wasn't really aware of until I was in my 20s um, when I first started sketching in college. Um, but the ideas that were behind it were sort of present in me before that time. Uh, the Ouroboros is... Uh, a symbol of self-reflexivity, um, cyclical sort of uh, behavior. And in, in, in an individual sense, I sort of keep circling back to things that I knew, photography, music, ideas, vision, form. And, and I find myself sort of trying to refine them. One of the sketches that was in that old uh, sketchbook ended up sort of re-emerging in this without me thinking about it. And I looked at it later and I was like, that kind of looks like that. And so it happens with me a lot where I sort of am circling around and looking at things. Um, in a social theory sense, reflexivity has a larger uh, meaning where you can feed the, the environment that you're in, you feed the community, you add to it, and it changes the environment. And that in turn will affect you to help it grow further. And that cycle, to me, is a part of the idea of sort of having the energy to keep going. If you can, if you can produce and share and, and communicate and make whatever it is that you make, then it's going to make a difference. And if you have the vision, the resources, and the passion to keep going, then do it. Because I want to see what you've got to do. You know, I want to see interesting stuff. I feed on the internet, but I feed it through conversations with my friends and all the people that I know who make stuff. So I, you know, it was it was funny to me to be the person who was chosen for this because there's so many people I know who make awesome stuff, and I think that it makes a difference if you if you execute. But a lot of that comes from the energy of the people around you. So um, I'm open for questions. Thanks for coming. It's planned. <laughs> I just, you know, that's one of those things I got right there. So it'll be a, it'll be a shoulder. Now I've been thinking about that for a decade. So, I, this, op, this presentation has offered me the opportunity to explore a lot more about it at a larger scale. But the idea that you can have an impact just by deciding, you know, in, in the Ouroboros or the idea of reflexivity in economics is fairly evident because if people decide they're going to buy houses and the more people buy them, the prices rise and it has an effect in the reverse. So economic theory of um, reflexivity is, you know, evident. This kind of impact that you can make by making the decision to just do it without regard for the environment is something that I was taught at a young age. You know, do what you love. And things will work out.
So, I, yeah, I, I want the tattoo because it means something to me. I just got to get around to it. <laughs> Anybody else? Mm -hmm. So how do you balance the time for that? Like, is it something you have to really intentionally make time for? Is it something you find yourself doing naturally? At times, you have to. I mean, I, I, I reach a point, and my girlfriend knows this, where I just get overloaded and I can't think about anything else but all the stuff I have to do. And I have to step aside, or I have to step out. And sometimes it just sort of happens. Um, in the last year, I got a new iPad and I pulled the sewing machine out and I started sewing and I just get into things. And sometimes it's not a known moment where you realize that you need it, but you see something and it'll drag you in and you'll wrap up in it and you're like, oh, you know, well that kind of saved me for a minute because I didn't realize that I needed that moment to separate from the things that drive me crazy. Um, so it's not, always, it's not always evident when that's gonna happen. I was just going to ask, is, is art the idea or the implementation? I have ideas, but I don't have the ability to implement some of them. So um, I think it's all of it. For me, art is process because like the, the cardboard chair that I built in college had this crazy jig and I almost liked the jig more than I liked the chair. Um, <laughs> and, and I think a lot of it, it starts to become that, you know, the process of these things is there are indications in the ice moons of three days worth of freezing and then there's the indication of the moment when it comes out of the freezer and pops. And the, the, the process is so integral to it that it's hard to separate them. Now, if you have something that you really are interested in, the way I do it is I just find somebody who knows about it and just grill them. And like Brian and photography, and he was immensely helpful. And usually people who, who like to do something that you want to learn about are pretty excited about sharing it. And I'm that way as much as I, I can. Um, you can find the resources. You can find the education. And especially with the internet now, all you have to do is Google, you know, I want to do blah, 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 and somebody's made a tutorial on it. Um, it's a little easier now than it used to be. But um, I think it's a little bit of everything. The end product is what everyone else gets to see, but the process is the secret that you get to keep that you go through, some of which can be very painful. So. And I, you know, you're a maker. You made, he made the mugs, just by the way. So. Yeah. Hey, man, can you talk about working with your group? I mean, they're a bunch of talented people, and I'm sure they have input and creative input into what you do and how that collaboration works. The, we, we sort of put it all in the pot, and when, you know, as far as the style of the work, the language, of the vision, that's more in sort of my direction. Although when it comes to architects and designers, you know, I'll collaborate with them. As far as the team goes, I'll get together with whoever it is that's going to be involved in the process and go, here's what I think, and you know, does this jive? Do you think this is going to work? And if they have uh, an argument about it, then they can change it. You know, I'm more than happy for the people who work with me to contribute in that way because seven brains are better than one. You know, it takes, uh, it takes a lot of work to get these things done and sometimes I'm just not around for it and I don't even know, you know, how they landed where they landed um, because there's so many things going on sometimes and so I'll just let it go. But um, we always end up with this, with awesome results and it's always a really amazing experience. I try to get them involved as much as I can and a lot of times if I'm trying to work, hash things out, I'll bring them in the office and go, what do you think about this? because I don't know. And they interject and it helps the flow of work. So they're, they're, they're crucial to the process in all, at all, in all levels. Um, you mentioned the creative community. Um, what if you talk more about you know, the community you're involved with and uh, how you feel about it, where it's going, how it's different from other communities? Raleigh particularly has grown immensely in the last, and you know, I've been here for 20 years, 22, 3, um, and it, I have conversations, Paul Friedrich and I have known each other for 20 years, and actually, I met Paul Friedrich and Ashley Christensen at the same party, like 20 some years ago, and he and I have sort of had these periodic five-year conversations about, wow, look at everything cool that's going on here, and all these people, and I, you know, when, when restaurants started popping up, I called Ashley and I was like, thanks for raising the bar because she introduced a culture that, that we had not really seen and it's starting to flourish. And I think these people all contribute in different ways. 
um, Brian Reagan, amazing photography, like all, Victor and Sarah in New York now, you know, these people are growing, our, our environment is changing. And just to be able to talk with these people to me is really the most amazing thing. And finding that we have the same sort of language, which, you know, Victor is one of those people that I had that conversation with where I was like, you just make it in denim, you know, and you're doing it, and he and I just sort of meet minds in that way. And I think that's the exciting part is to know that you can have conversations with people that have the same sort of drive to see the whole community grow, to see CAM develop into what it has, see the gallery scene down here just, you know, alive with people and energy and excitement. Everything's growing. And so that's my observation is it's amazing how much things have changed in the time that I've been here. And all I see is that much more and, and I just have the, I'm lucky I've had the opportunity to actually have some conversations with pe these people, you know, Kim who's sitting next to you, I'm going to call you out, she's opening a, a, a place downtown soon and um, these sorts of things, they feed our community, it's a part of that circle that I was talking about which is why it's so important to me. Um. I mean, looking at some of the stuff that you have created, it's amazing, and I, and I imagine that it must take an incredible um, structure around it to accomplish some of this stuff. And um, I wonder if you could speak about how you managed to create a structure around you that um, allows for the accomplishment of tasks like must be accomplished while still letting you be creative in a way that um, and maybe freeze you up, I don't know, something like that. No, I, um, the machine is what I call it, because you have to feed the machine, and the machine costs money, and that's business. You know, you have rent, you have to pay the bills, you have to do all this stuff, and sometimes in order to feed the machine, you gotta do things that you wouldn't necessarily wanna do. We don't wanna get the freedom to just be like, this is all I want to do today. Um, uh, and so th the percentage of time that is sort of the free-flowing thought idea is, is not what I think any of us would wish that it would be. Any of us who run a business sort of learn, and that was the struggle that sort of spawned the ice moons was, man, I gotta spend all this time with all this paper and stuff. Um, but there's a, I rely on the people that are, that are working with me to help me sort of keep things organized. By nature, I'm not terribly organized, <laughs> and it's difficult, but when all these things are going on, um, and it doesn't always work. That's a part of the failure you know, that Bryce was talking about is, you know, sometimes you take on too much and you can't really handle it and you've got to figure out a way to make it through. And in the end, like with the symbol piece, I didn't know, you know, I actually came through the studio the night before I got the final word on that and she said, how is this going to work? And I said, I don't know, it'll happen. And you just have to sort of decide that you're going to make it through. So the, the organization is, you know, project management using Basecamp to put all the, all the projects into a file and make sure the task lists are organized and sort of do all that. And with presentations, things like this, you know, Mary was giving me help because I was talking about how I get all passionate and do things. And she said, you mean like this presentation, which you've been working on for a month? Because um, I dork out on stuff. But I, I think keeping it organized can be a real challenge. And I think particularly for somebody like me who's all over the map and trying to sort of keep track of all of it, it gets to be too much. Um, and so I, I, I rely on the people that work with me to help me with that. We use computer software and you know, try to make lists and organize. Um, but sometimes it works beautifully and everything is boom, done. Sometimes it's a mess. Um, and it just, you hope that it's less mess and more organized. But it's, it's just going, okay, I'll figure it out and keep moving. Sort of a military way of thinking you know, charge ahead, get it done, keep moving. But with art. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Jonathan. Uh, have there been things that you have convinced yourself in your head that it was gonna happen and you had a very specific vision for it and then it just wasn't happening? Yes, and all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's your process and cycle for then kind of reconciling that and dealing with that and, and keeping the momentum going? Because sometimes for me on a project, it's so hard to just let that go because I believe in it so much. There is a way of life that calls for absorbing unknowns. And you have to sort of frame your way of 
living every day with, I don't have control over everything. And I think the challenge of life is to figure out what it is that you do have control over. And if you want to point yourself in a direction, you can say, this is where I want to end up, but my path might be all over the place. And you might not even end up where you want to as long as you've got a goal to get there. But the, the problems, you know, the first time one of these things came out of the mold and it cracked, it freaked me out. And I was like, it's done. I didn't, you know. And then I looked at it and I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And that's, you know, a lot of times the problems actually end up being beautiful and sort of amazing. We were having, I was having that conversation with Nate Schaefer earlier. It's, you know, the mistakes can actually be the best part of the whole thing. So you have to be open to that. You have to sort of be able to deal with the fact that it's not what you wanted it to be, but that it's still really amazing. And the fact that you just did something, you know, do it, make it happen, can be the goal in the end. But I, I'll tell you, I got, a I got a pile of bad art on top of my office that I, that I built and I just hate. So, like, you, you can't, uh, what is it they say? You can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs? Like, you, you're, gonna, you, you're gonna screw things up. You just have to say, that the only problem with that is that if you have a client, you have a deadline, it has to be perfect, it has to be done, and you've got this much time and it must happen. Like, and that happens a lot. Um, especially in, the, in, you know, architecture, restaurant, business, a lot of things happen, you know, instantly. So you gotta be prepared. And a lot of it is just a state of mind, which carries through life. It's not just about work. Yeah. I think it's a great place to wrap up. Thank you guys. Uh, <laughs>